for the final session of Queen's University's Global History Initiatives Workshop Series. My name is Michael Borsk, and I'm one of the organizers of this year's workshop. Along with my co-organizers, I want to say how pleased we are that you all could join us here today. As our workshop's theme is Global Histories of Colonialism, let us begin by acknowledging that Queen's University is situated on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Today, this meeting place remains the home of many indigenous nations. We are glad for the opportunity to live and learn on these lands as we work to uphold the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant and all subsequent treaty relations. While we are not all able to gather together today in Cataraqui itself, we are grateful for the ability to come together to think about how the legacies of colonialism have shaped our relationships to the land we inhabit across the globe and support the survivance of indigenous peoples around the world. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a few words of thanks. First to our faculty co-conveners, Amitava Chowdhury and Ashita Pandey, and the Global History Initiative Steering Committee member, Sandra Donauder. For all their guidance and encouragement in this process, they've helped make this project possible. Members of Queen's University History Department have graciously agreed to chair panels, and for all their time and expertise, we sincerely thank them. A special thanks goes as well to our department chair, Rebecca Manley, as well as department staff members, Matt Colby and Kathy Dickinson. Financial support for this week's workshop is generously provided by the Bernice Nugent bequest. I will now invite Amitava Chowdhury to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Chris Manjapra. Professor Chowdhury is an associate professor in the Department of History, whose research explores the history of agrarian labor regimes and colonial plantations in the British Caribbean and Indian Ocean. He's also deeply interested in the meaning of global history and its theories. In addition to his role as co-convener of this year's Global History Initiative, he likewise serves as our department's undergraduate chair, a very busy job this year. Please join me in welcoming Professor Chowdhury to today's session. Thank you, Michael, and hello, everyone. So at the end of what has been a truly engaging and interesting event spanning over two days, uh, it has fallen on me to launch the final scheduled event of this conference. Um, but like Mike, I'll also like to congratulate, but this time the organizing team of this conference, Elise, Alex, uh, Michael uh, Borsk, Ksenia, Michael Ross, and Russell for a very successful event and indeed for the care and thoughtfulness with which you have um, organized the entire event. Uh, thank you to all the panel chairs and attendees from around the world who have been a part of this event. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Chris Manjapra. Chris, as some of you would know, is no stranger to our department, having earlier given a talk uh, in 2014, I believe. Um, I was supposed to introduce you, Chris, Chris, then, but I was away in a different continent. And now, while you aren't here, and I am in the same building where you gave the last talk, the undifferentiated singularity of the virtual world uh, affords us the chance to reconnect again. So Professor Manjapra is the chair of the uh, Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism and Diaspora at Tufts University, where he is also a professor in the Department of History. He's known to us as a scholar of global and transnational history and an historian of issues of race, colonialism, and African and Indian diaspora studies. He has also made important contributions to areas of modern European and modern uh, South Asian history. But overall, perhaps most pertinent to, to today's talk, uh, Professor Manjapra is a scholar of connected histories of the global South. I want to begin by talking about Chris's 2014 book, Age of Entanglement, German and Indian intellectuals across empire, which is a book known to many of you, at least certainly to about 50 graduate students in the department who have read the book in one of my courses for the last several years. Uh, it is a, a truly global intellectual history of the interactions, connections, and entanglement of the actions and thought horizons of German and uh, Indian intellectuals spanning from the fields of theoretical physics through to economics, anthropology, psychoanalysis, and art. 
And some of these interactions between the Germans and Indian intellectuals uh, were regressive and, and touch on areas of Aryanism, Aryan theory, and frequently bordered on being illiberal. But by and large, the shared intellectual horizon of the German and Indian luminaries discussed in the book um, imagined an alternative world outside of the dominant Anglo-centric hegemony from the late 19th century to mid 20th century. Uh, the book won the 2019 Mark Tagore Award, awarded by the Goethe Institute. Uh, this, however, was Professor Manjapra's third book, having earlier edited a book on cosmopolitan thought zones, along with Sugata Bose, as well as a monograph on Manovendranath Roy or, or M.N. Roy um, earlier in 2010. Most recently, of course, he has just published his new book, Colonialism in Global Perspective, just a few months ago from Cambridge University Press, a book uh, that will form the basis of his talk today. Professor Manjapra is also the author of numerous other important articles and chapters, some of which have truly helped shape the current directions of global history. Um, apart from the book award I mentioned, Professor Manjapra has held um, important fellowships at the uh, Vision Shops College to Berlin, as well as the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University in the last few years. At Tufts, uh, Professor Manjapra is also the co-director of the South Asian Digital Humanities Project, as well as the Transnational Studies Working Group. So it is my enormous pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce Professor Manjapra and welcome him back to Queens. Please welcome Professor Manjapra, Chris, it's all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Amitabha, I appreciate it. Your introduction very generous um, as well as the invitation uh, and I look forward to our um, conversation uh, together uh, after my presentation um, and I'll be speaking on my latest uh, book uh, colonialism and global perspective drawing out some of the main arguments and um, some of the stakes and um, I look forward to your input, questions, critiques, um, as we kind of work through what I think is the, the question in the room. Um, what does global history look like in our 21st century? Um, and maybe we could say within the context of the emergencies and the, the horizon of catastrophe that uh, is, is now so familiar to us, uh, actually for quite some time now as we've entered this, um, this 21st century. Let me begin by uh, reading from uh, the introduction to the book. And then from there, I have some prepared comments. And um, after that, we can discuss. So a study of colonialism in global perspective starts with this journey. Take tram number 44 from Leopold II Square in Brussels to the end of the line, to the leafy suburb of Tervuren through the Foray de Swan. The final stop leads you to the Royal Museum for Central Africa. Africa. Belgian King Leopold II, mastermind of colonization of Central Africa and its 20 million inhabitants, built this ostentatious palace that today houses the museum. The Congo Free State has nothing to hide and no secrets, Leopold once proclaimed from this palace, adding, it is, not, uh, it is not beholden to anyone except its founder. And here he was speaking of himself. Today, the museum possesses 120,000 ethnographic objects, the world's largest hoard of Africana. This includes an impressive collection of African masks, one of the great ritual art forms of the people in the Niger and Congo basins. African dancers don these masks in ceremony to expose and witness hidden truths and to make ancestral spirits visible. Now these masks and the truths that they are meant to reveal lie appropriated and buried in the belly of the Tervoren and also hidden away as if in a large tomb of secrets is the history of Belgian colonial war and atrocity and its ongoing social legacies in Africa and Europe. So 
In fact, there is a special class of artifacts held at the Turvuren um, that are the human remains. And this is uh, a phenomenon across many European museums and American museums. During colonial times, we are aware of the practice uh, of harvesting for science the bodies of the colonized after their premature uh, death, after their murder and, pre and, and therefore their premature death, and then the sending of these body parts um, back to the imperial centers as they were converted uh, into uh, uh, material for scientific investigation and for museum display. There is a kind of, um, if you like, a, a transformation of, of, of substance that, that takes place um, through this colonial circuit, almost a transubstantiation, if you like. Now, the museum is a place of pageantry and of display for this kind of transubstantiation of value, uh, but it is also a realm of secrets, a hoard of mal-appropriated wealth, including the wealth of the different genres of human being and the stories that accord to these different genres of humanity. I'll say something about what I mean by the genres of human being later on and share with you uh, uh, the link to an article that, that I co-wrote with my colleague Lisa Lowe, um, very much addressing that theme. Some of you may, may be aware of that piece. Now, part of my work in this book, Colonialism and Global Perspective, is to answer the question, what happens when we witness this history? Uh, what does it mean to witness histories of disavowal and of denial, um, of erasure, of effacement, uh, of overrepresentation, which in fact are the structure for uh, the regime of knowledge in which we operate? Um, can we disrupt this uh, order of effacement and of overrepresentation? Uh, in order to address the epistemic constraints of the very field, the very discipline that we work within, the, the field of history, um, and now the field specifically of global history. Throughout the book, I try to make something that is complicated, i.e. the study of colonialism, into something that is straightforward and simple. And here, I do this um, because I, I feel I'm reacting against perhaps a generation of scholarship. Um, I, I think of it as the 1990s, uh, in which there was a real premium placed on, um, how would we put it, um, on circumlocution and uh, the overuse of, of, of unnecessary jargon. Uh, and I do feel that we are at a different moment now in which um, there is a lot of emphasis that many scholars are placing uh, on clarity, and I think that there's a politics to clarity, which relates to this practice of witnessing um, that I've grown very interested in, and it informs the way that I write, it informs the way that I try to communicate, um, and I think it's, it's a part of the story of, of what I'd like to be discussing uh, today, not just the content, but also the form of how we write uh, as historians. Throughout the book, uh, um, I break colonialism in global perspective down into uh, four parts. I've been looking at the book, you know, in order in preparation for this presentation. And I realized I, I grew quite interested in, in quartets, in, in fours. Um, and so there, there are four big parts to uh, how I break colonialism down. I see it as a, first of all, as a real and ongoing uh, structure, as opposed to a simply a a set of events or an event that concluded at some point in the past. And I see it as having four component parts. The modern form of capitalist war, first of all, um, and uh, racial capitalism. And I'm gonna say more about racial capitalism soon um, because for me, this is a kind of a crux of how we may understand what I think of as the new colonialism, the colonialism that emerged from the 1400s onwards. So in addition to um, capitalist war and racial uh, capitalism, I um, see another dimension here of uh, colonialism as involving racializing rule, 
which seeks to assign different groups of the human to uh, different uh, categories, different roles, um, to, to sequester groups, um, and even to eradicate, eradicate them. Third is the dimension of moral deception that colonialism demonstrates this uh, interest or this ability, uh, not just in um, the, the attempt to control material forms, but also mental forms uh, and to uh, affect the mind stuff. And in fact, uh, deception plays a very important role in how colonialism works. And here I also categorize uh, disavowal, denial, as well as the effects of um, deception on the colonized themselves, in fact, often in their own ability to recognize their situation. And however, the last dimension here of these four dimensions that I focus on is what I call transformative resistance. The response of the colonized continually disrupts and changes the plot line. It changes the story, it changes the meaning of what colonialism is. Colonialism is itself, yes, an ongoing force, uh, but it is also always part of a counter history. And the counter history is that of decolonization. So when we think of the ongoing legacies of colonialism in terms of our capitalist modernity, the new Jim Crow, the ongoing attack on black life globally, on indigenous, indigenous life globally, uh, the disenfranchisement and uh, indebting of the global south in ongoing and exacerbating ways. We are, uh, by putting all of these different uh, experiences uh, together, we're creating, I think, a kind of conceptual framework to discuss different kinds of relationship. But so too, I think the other side of this is to be able to glimpse the relationships and the entanglements uh, of forms of survival and persistence and resistance between what may, many times appear to be distant and unrelated groups, but upon closer study, especially with the right conceptual framework, uh, show up as, in fact, highly interrelated um, uh, features of our modern times. Um, and I, I think this, this feature of the decolonizing present uh, is very characteristic of what I'm thinking of as this new 21st century era uh, in which we live within the horizon of catastrophe. So I just presented you with one quartet, these four dimensions of uh, colonialism. Uh, the book moves on to discuss another quartet, which is four concrete uh, histories that uh, I see as a kind of foundation to understand the historical origins of the new colonialism. Uh, I focus on histories of conquest, histories of settlement, histories of enslavement, and histories of port imperialism. And here I'm drawing on deep veins of scholarship, you know, settler colonialism, settler colonialism studies, critical indigenous studies, uh, black study, and um, also the study of liberal empire, um, all of which are, uh, you might say, important mm, dimensions of colonialism studies or even post-colonialism studies. But as of yet, I be believe we're still working towards a way of putting these different insights, these different literatures together uh, into a more connected kind of um, critical framework. And, and I see my book as, as, as one contribution to that. I think this is ongoing work. Um, and I think that's where we are headed. I, I do believe that we're moving somewhere in terms of how we, we connect the dots between the way we have studied colonialism, often in a much more kind of world region, sometimes area studies um, framework um, previously. And so that's why I'm interested in relating, and a, relationality is a key word for me, relating histories of the Americas, of Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Pacific in a way that also uh, tries to disrupt um, unify, uh, what we might call homogenizing comparisons, uh, but instead is interested in how we, how we uh, understand and uh, connect um, histories of different qualities uh, of, with different dynamics 
um, and with, uh, in fact, different meanings associated with them. So that's an abstract statement, but I'll say more about it um, in a clearer way in a moment. Let me now move on to, um, before I, I uh, before I talk about um, the key term parallax, which I'm going to come to in a, in a moment, um, let me say a little bit more about racial capitalism. So what I'm trying to do in, in these comments is to lay out what I see as some of the again, mistakes, the, uh, the conceptual uh, payload that I'm trying to deliver in this book. Um, recognizing that those that my audience here are likely a, a group of very um, keen uh, graduate students who are interested in, in, you know, questions around what does it mean to, to do history today. And so I'm kind of framing these comments in um, that spirit. So racial capitalism, a, a key term that I think um, is, is really essential to thinking about colonialism and global perspective. I define this as related to the principle of profit maximization that began to penetrate deeper and deeper into the realm of life. Um, we see this taking place beginning uh, in the colonial Spanish Americas um, from really the 1400s onwards, in which um, colonialism is no longer only um, the pursuit of suzerainty or dominion over lands and peoples as it had been for many hundreds of years, if not uh, millennia, but now takes on an early capitalist extractive logic uh, in which human, animal, and environmental beings are increasingly subjected to racializing production processes. So it, to boil this down, I'm saying that there is something new that begins taking place in the 1400s. And what is new in the new colonialism is uh, on the one hand, the emergence of early capitalism. And on the other hand, within that inherent to this early capitalism is a racializing logic. And I'm going to define this a little bit more next. These racializing production processes which mark the origin of racial capitalism, established ways of relating um, that were quite unprecedented uh, between the ongoing accumulation of wealth among dominant um, groups and the exposure of oppressed um, groups to disproportionate vulnerability and to premature death. So this is a formulation that comes out of work of, of Ruth Gilmore. Um, and it's a relational definition of what I mean by uh, racial capitalism. This penetration of the profit maximizing principle deeper and deeper into the realm of life, which is what I define as capitalism, uh, as a general definition of the capitalist logic. This penetration of the profit maximizing principle deeper and deeper into the realm of life was inherently and inextricably tied to the killing and destruction of some human groups in order to ensure the accumulation and the wealth and the securitization of other human groups. So here we have a relational dynamic um, that is at the heart of the new colonialism. Um, in other words, the origins of uh, this form of capitalism uh, from the 1400s onwards was intrinsically uh, also the origins of racialization. And furthermore, this emerging racial capitalism was inherently necropolitical. And by necropolitical, I mean death-making by calculation. The uh, processes of deriving value and uh, meaning from the very acts of um, killing off. So as opposed to the management of life, which we think of as biopolitical processes following Foucault, um, scholars such as Achille Mbembe and others have pointed to the value producing uh, potential uh, of death-making, um, of killing. 
And, uh, and in fact, this is what Mbembe calls uh, necropolitics, the management of death. Uh, and we see this emerging um, interest in the management of death making uh, taking place from the 1400s onwards and arguing. So we are, and in fact, we are still suspended in this colonial racial capitalist formation. Our present day can only be understood by recognizing the ongoing mutating durability of this long-term formation of capitalism. So there I gave you a large set of key terms. I, I, I tried to define them, um, but I'm happy to discuss all of this um, in more detail. Now, the origins of the new kind of conquest that emerged from this moment around the 1400s onwards, the efforts to genocide, to remove, uh, to efface the presence of indigenous peoples in the Americas, uh, continued from the 1500s into the 16 and 1700s, which became the kind of new high watermark for settler colonialism, especially as it now begins to touch uh, the, uh, the, the North, the American North. The same period also sees the interlinking of slavery and the rise of the plantation complex as, the, as unprecedented forms of death making, unprecedented necropolitical projects, new ways of managing death making for the accumulation of um, capital uh, emerge across Africa and across the slave markets and plantations of the Atlantic islands and the American continent during this period, the 16 and the 1700s. Um, we see during this period an unprecedented unleashing of energy, agronomic energy, productive labor energy, reproductive energy, uh, more than the world had ever seen before. Again, racial capitalism uh, is this or is part of this drive to press the principle of profit maximization deeper and deeper into the realm of life through differentially assigning living beings, some to security and some to premature death. And, and I would argue that this, this pursuit is also one of freeing up energy. Um, of, of making energy uh, circulate in, in new ways, um, of mining energy, of extracting energy and accumulating um, its value uh, in, in, new, in new ways. Um, and so simultaneous with an unprecedented squandering of energy, agronomic, agro, agronomical energy, uh, human energy, uh, environmental energy, we also see an unprecedented potential emerge for the accumulation of um, this energy uh, and the meanings associated with it uh, amongst the colonized. Finally, by the mid 1700s, following the rise of new travel technologies and more centralized forms of governmental administration and statecraft, Asian polities, many of which were marked by already by forms of, of, of empire on their own, Asian polities uh, are now increasingly tied into these emergent processes of new colonialism. Here, the rise of imperial liberalism uh, as expressed very clearly in Adam Smith's vision of a world economy of comparative advantage uh, provided uh, um, the opportunities to now link Asia for the first time with Africa Europe and the Americas, as well as the Pacific, Pacific into um, this accumulationist system, a new colonial system that came to now belt the world and to link together uh, an array of diasporas, European diasporas, African diasporas, indigenous diasporas, uh, Asian diasporas, many of whom uh, were traveling under duress, under the threat of dread force, um, and uh, not uh, under free under their free will. By the 1800s, the lives and the histories of indigenous people, African people, Asian and Pacific Island people, as well as European peoples had been fully intertwined. They were intertwined by differential racializations, uh, 
of native dispossession, slavery, indentureship, unfree waged labor. And for this, for this reason, race, as I am using it, and I think as a number of scholars are seeking to continually use this term, especially in critical race studies, is not meant as an identity term or as a census category. It's in fact meant to disrupt the census categories. It is, an, it is a relational term. To study race in this way is to study how we are in fact caught up in each other's histories. At an essential level to study race in global perspective is to study how certain groups disproportionate exposure to vulnerability and to premature death is the condition for the securitization and the accumulation of other groups. So that's a relational question and it shows up in so many different manifestations across the globe. It, it, that becomes a very important project of recognizing these manifestations and finding out how they, uh, they are entangled together. The global def definition of race, one that is both differential on one hand um, and comparative uh, on the other and operates uh, and is able to operate and make sense of different uh, social dynamics across the world is a main concern of my book. So colonialism and global perspective requires that we understand race as a differentiated global category, and but one that does not impose conceptual homogeneity, but asks us to unpack the variations and the differentials uh, of this, um, this dynamic, of uh, the ways that disproportionate vulnerability um, is the condition for capitalist accumulation. Basically, it's the dynamic of necropolitics, um, which defines, um, which defines our are present as it has defined hundreds of years of our past. So now let me switch to um, another key term, which um, really fascinated me in this book. And it, it comes out of um, some, some very um, inspiring uh, collaborative work that I was fortunate to be able to do with interdisciplinary scholars in the formation we have at Tufts. And for those who are interested, there's a whole story here about the creation of a new department and the ways that um, the department represents, um, I think, something important um, about knowledge production. So ask me about this if, if, if you'd be interested. Uh, I'd be happy to share more. But one of the, the key terms that emerged in our work together as an interdisciplinary group was that of parallax. And you'll see it referenced, you see I use it in, in, in globalist, uh, colonialism and global perspective. I define parallax very simply as the multiplied perspective. We must be able to hold different kinds of relationships, different qualities of relationality in our mind at once and to weigh their interrelation in order to understand colonialism in global perspective. Comparative histories that rely on the replication of the same, whether that unit is the nation state or uh, the world region uh, or perhaps the category of modern itself um, are um, uh, a, 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 as a way of connecting societies uh, are not satisfactory because they do not adequately open up for us the analysis of power which we uh, very much need to pursue. The practice of parallax on the other hand taking what I'm calling the multiplied perspective the analysis of how different relations of power operate in entangled and simultaneous ways is what is needed. And with that in mind, I spend the last half of the book looking at different dynamics of colonial power from um, what I'm thinking of as the elementary aspects of how colonial power functions through, for example, discourses of science and expertise or through performances of pedagogy or through finance and financial instruments or through geopolitical relations and partitioning, or through biopower. I look at these different fields, not to say that they are sufficient uh, or exhaustive in how we think of um, the, the dynamics of power inherent to colonialism, but so as to make more manifest and more concrete this argument that I have about um, ad adopting a multiplied uh, perspective. If the new colonialism is the story of how racial capitalism pushes or penetrates uh, 
the principle of profit maximization deeper and deeper into the realm of life and does so with, uh, with the horizon of the infinite in mind. I mean, there's an endlessness to, uh, to this pursuit, to this capitalist pursuit, which is also part of the catastrophe that it has inherent in it. Then we can also observe the variations um, of the domains of life in which this pursuit uh, uh, takes place. Colonialism's tools range across um, some of the most overt uh, and visible of uh, terrains, whether we think of the use of weapons uh, and gunboats you know, to control oceans and land masses, or we think of the use of prisons um, to cage human beings um, and to, to transport them, or we think of border walls that divide large swaths of territory. Um, so colonialism is about those dynamics, but it also averts, uh, works less uh, overtly, such as through the very tools of knowledge production within modern science. It also works in very uh, subtle and invisible ways, such as within the realm of uh, finance and the instruments of uh, credit and debt. It also works, colonialism also works deeply within the realm of the intimate um, and in the realm of the embodied uh, in, in, a, in the domain of uh, the sexual through the protocols of binary gendering, through cis normativities uh, and through the internalized policing of the body. So colonialism, colonial power is working through all of these or along within all of these different domains, which I'm defining as the domains of life. So the domains of life being um, a kind of umbrella through which we can um, then parcel out these different ways in which colonial power manifests and has been manifesting for, uh, for, for a long time, but also then mo modulating and modifying over time. At each stage in my study of colonialism, I observe that the operations of power have always uh, and inextricably their counter history. This counter history is the history of the responses, the resistances, the creative accommodations, uh, the reinterpretations of the colonized, of the oppressed that in fact, as I'm saying, change the plot, change the meaning of what colonialism is. There is no history of colonialism in isolation from the histories of response and resistance to, uh, coloni to colonialism. There is no thesis in history without also the antithesis. And there's an argument I, I kind of make at the very, very beginning of this book that says that, you know, we can very easily turn the tables on how we think of colonialism. We often ascribe power, uh, you know, to the term of the colonial uh, or the, the colonizer and a certain disempowerment to the term of the colonized. But in fact, we might observe that racialized rule is precisely that incomplete, always incomplete and always failing attempt of uh, those who uh, uh, command, uh, the, the command power to control what cannot be controlled, to stamp out what can simply not be stamped out or to efface what cannot uh, be ever fully occluded. Um, that that colonialism, colonialism and colonial power um, is in some ways the story of a failure because decolonizing impulses and decolonizing force simply always return. They are as structural to uh, our history as perhaps is uh, the colonial force that is seeking to, to rule over, over them. So um, having said all of that, let me just now share with you um, a document which you're very welcome to look at um, as I uh, I don't know if I can share. I, I, I don't think I can share a document because um, I don't think I have permission, but it's, um, it's, a, it's the co-written co uh, essay that I have with uh, Professor Lisa Lowe. Perhaps I can send it uh, to Mike uh, later and he can share it with the group. That will give you uh, just, uh, I think, a little bit um, more um, clarity on some of the terms that I'm using, especially parallax. Uh, as well as you know the, the ways that we may think of the genres of the human within this um, within some of, within the formulation that I've I've proposed. So I'll let that I'll let that be. 
Um, and I will now move to sharing with you just some slides to um, demonstrate another aspect of the book and what I was what I've been trying to do in the book. So I hope my slides are now um, showing. So let me begin by here going to so here's just a, a large visual um, of interconnection of relationalities um, that uh, allow us to place the, um, the Americas as uh, the beginning of uh, both a new kind of uh, extraction uh, of, 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 of life, uh, native histories that are confronting for the first time a new kind of conquest uh, as well as the emergence of uh, racial slavery. Um, at the Americas uh, as sitting at the center of this story of the new colonialism. And then just visually, you know, the variety of uh, interrelations uh, that um, begin to emerge uh, in, in a way that, that relates back to uh, some of the, the historical markers that I was discussing um, just about 10 minutes ago or so. So I'll leave that be and move on to, uh, let's see, I don't want to go there, but I want to go to this. So I want to use some of these images to um, now have a conversation about the archive and about how we as scholars of history can begin rethinking the archive and the parameters of knowledge that the archive represents. So here, this is a chasuble, it's a uh, garb, it's a cloak worn by Augustinian friars. And this uh, particular piece is something I've seen in person at Valladolid in Spain. Um, it was worn by friars working uh, in, in the Philippines uh, during the, the time of Spanish colonialism, the, the early period of Spanish colonialism in the Philippines. Now I'm interested in the book in this, uh, um, artifact um, for its production history uh, and for what its production history tells us about this, uh, the history of, of global, of colonialism and global perspective. We see, for example, um, that this cloak was embroidered by Chinese um, artisans uh, located on the, uh, on the coast of, of China um, and that the images that are sewn or embroidered into this are very much both uh, drawing upon Chinese uh, emblems and symbols as well as the emblems that were desired by the consumers, those who were purchasing these precious uh, garments, in this case, um, the Portuguese uh, and specifically the, the Portuguese uh, um, friars, the Augustinians, uh, who bought cloaks like this from China and then transported them you know, across um, to new colonies and through the galleon trade, they made their way to the Americas and they made their way onwards back to Europe. And so a cloak like this might be worn by friars um, on the frontiers in the Philippines as much as in the center of uh, Castilian Spain around the same time in the 16 and the 1700s. Encoded here is a story of a number of different histories um, again, histories of what? Histories on the one hand of accumulation of the securitization of particular groups, um, of the overrepresentation of certain groups, uh, ideologies, um, and um, uh, even their aesthetic forms that was related intrinsically and inherently to the exposure of other groups uh, to premature death. And the, the, the groups that I have um, in mind are certainly the, uh, the Filipino uh, indigenous peoples who would have been uh, um, uh, in relationship to these friars, who would have served these friars, um, and who would have perhaps uh, been uh, important in the galleon trade in terms of um, preparing the boats to be sent uh, or perhaps sometimes co-opted into the colonial warfare that the Spanish were carrying out uh, in, uh, on, the Spanish on the Filipino archipelago. So here is another document that I believe can also be read for a global history of colonialism, uh, a document in material form. 
Um, this is an engraved desk, an engraved desk by Nipmuc Algonquin artisans on display uh, at the Natick Historical Society um, here in Massachusetts. And it is a preacher's desk. It is also from uh, the late 1600s, 1600s, early 1700s. Now this was engraved by indigenous artisans who again were being co-opted into uh, the settler colonial regime in uh, what came to be known as New England uh, after the name of the colonizers. And uh, this Natick was itself a, 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 a quote unquote praying town, uh, uh, an early form of a reservation that uh, Anglo settlers were establishing in order to sequester indigenous peoples and to educate them to, uh, to, to, to colonize uh, their minds. And here we see how despite that process and despite the uh, incorporation that was taking place, the colonized are always speaking back. They're, they're always challenging the form and sometimes in ways that really require us to look twice and to develop new ways of reading and to go back to where I began my talk, new, new ways of witnessing um, history. And so here, just on the side of the desk, you see that the, uh, the, the engravers have actually made it look like a deer skin. Um, and then at the bottom of the desk, you see the feet uh, engraved as deer feet. And the back, which you can't see, is also um, a, a deer skin engraving. And so, so this desk has been, if you like, uh, wrapped in deer skin. And uh, there's a kind of uh, um, animism to the desk as well as it has dear feet. And this references, of course, the sovereign culture uh, of the uh, peoples, of the Nikmat peoples, their indigenous traditions, these, uh, the meaning of the wearing of deer skin, um, even as it's part of the Christian preacher's desk. And so here, there's this kind of slyness of the colonized that counts for um, this counter history or counts towards this counter history that, um, that is inherent to colonialism itself. Another example that I describe in the book, and I'll go through these last two quite quickly and then um, just read from the, uh, the last portion of my book and then conclude. So here we have uh, a beautiful example of um, both the, the intimacy of resistance as well as the, the creativity of the oppressed these are game pieces that are from a plantation in Medford, not far from where I'm speaking to you here in Massachusetts. It was a, a slave plantation. Very commonly, uh, the enslaved found uh, opportunities regularly to recreate together, to uh, find sucker and joy and pleasure, um, even in the midst of uh, the, the monstrosity of slavery itself. So here, we have everyday objects like uh, plates and bowls, which would have been part of the oppression, the experience of oppression, which are being actively transformed into game pieces, um, which would have been played in the late at night um, as, uh, as enslaved folk uh, found community together. And, and so many uh, scholars point to these intimate stories of resistance as essential for us to also capture and to include in our archive. I think of the beautiful work of Saidia Hartman, um, her, her, her earlier work as well as her, her current work also on the erotics of um, the colonized uh, and, and how and where we go about looking for our counter histories um, for the antithesis to the thesis um, that is overrepresented, the, the visuality of colonial power which is overrepresented in historical narrative. And finally, um, I'll give you one last example from uh, the Caribbean. This is a um, drawing done by uh, a Chinese teacher in uh, the Caribbean, in, the, in Cuba uh, from 1871. And I love this image because of how detailed it is depicting different communities of indentured servants who are being brought uh, to the plantation the, we see uh, uh, plantation workers from India and plantation workers from, uh, the, from coastal China who are arriving. But when you look very carefully again, we see this thought bubble opening up. You see it um, uh, on the right-hand side, or maybe it's the left, depending on how it's represented in your screen, of this uh, indentured worker whose blood is being symbolically drawn 
and it's filling this cup. So here's that theme, I think, of, of, of life, um, the penetration of, of profit maximization deeper and deeper into the realm of life. I believe that is being uh, metaphorically represented here by the blood drawing, by the paras par paradisism, um, uh, the parasitical relationship that is uh, on display. But even despite that parasitical relationship, we see this thought bubble open up as the in Chinese indentured laborer imagines family, imagines loved ones. Um, uh, and again, speaking to the power of the mind, the power um, of the spirit to overcome uh, the forces of, of colonialism and the deceptions that uh, it um, that it entails. So those are some images that I wanted to share. And I hope that in sharing the images and speaking to you about how I was reading them, um, you'll also see that I'm trying to make some methodological headway. Uh, as a historian, I wasn't trained to, to read images like this, but um, it's something that I, I have grown very, um, very interested in, in order to try to gain witness and then draw out the counter histories that are in fact encoded in our um, normative histories of, of what colonialism is. So now let me finally conclude by reading a, a, a paragraph from my epilogue and um, saying uh, a very last word. So let me see where my piece is here. Okay, I'll read from this paragraph. So what in the end is colonialism? It is a force field of social power and social differentiation that structures societies on a global scale today. This field of forces has emerged over hundreds of years through ongoing capitalist wars, projects in racialized rule and the practices of deception and denial as well as through continuously countervailing big and small acts of transformative resistance, rebellion, and rememory. That's a, another key term, which I do define earlier in this chapter. Colonialism is not an amorphous cloud, but a taut social fabric composed of highly differentiated and dissimilar threads vibrating together in tension. We endeavor to practice parallax, to study this tensile fabric of relations, to practice a way of seeing that holds together uneven and discordant perspectives on shared historical le legacies. We explored a multiplicity of colonial histories and practices in different times and places of racial capital capitalism, juxtaposing forms of resistance that continue to thwart master designs. Colonialism and the irreverent responses of the colonized are recursive, yet also dynamic. In this book, we developed a description of different interlocking colonial histories, each of which had particular and distinctive implications for subjected, subject, for subjected and oppressed groups who also contested and transformed these histories. We considered settler colonial conquests and native acts of resistance in the Spanish Americas, the Anglo Americas and the Pacific. We explored histories of racial slavery and anti-black racism and African diasporic liberation struggles in the new world. We examined the expansion of racial capitalist empire across Asia and the contestation of Asian indentured migrants and Asian states from the 18th century onwards. We noted forms of the new colonialism that continue to target oppressed groups today and the decolonizing responses on the part of these groups. As much as colonial forces act upon the colonized, these forces arise as fearful and anxious reactions to the ongoing resistant agencies of the colonized. So I think I'll, I'll end with that and just observe that I, um, in my last, in my epilogue, I um, noted three, this here it's three as opposed to four, but three different ma major ways in which we see colonial um, decolonizing practices emerging in our time. And this 
21st century. I focus especially on abolition struggles, on sovereignty movements, sovereignty assertions, and on people's democracy movements. And I use those three categories in order to again offer um, the question, how do we begin to more accurately um, uh, grasp how different kinds of decolonizing practices that characterize this moment that we're in, this 21st century, uh, how do we grasp them as being interrelated, as not being distant or not being unrelated, but in fact is being part of, in fact, a formation um, as part of the logic of this history, that this global history that we are um, living through. So I, I find that in a, a very timely, very timely question, given everything that that, that we've seen and, and where we're headed. Um, and I think I'll stop there and um, let's open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you, Chris, for a, what I thought was a profoundly important talk. Um, struck by your reflection that colonialism can never succeed. There is an inherent impossibility of the success of colonialism. And the thought that something that divides can perhaps never ever be defined as a success. Uh, I particularly like the way you navigated the changeability, the mutations of uh, colonialism. I'm reminded here of our past conversations and how we should do global history by looking at one individual locale perhaps and then try to capture the world through that complexities, the local stories of a global process. But at the same time, you were able to um, describe colonial, colonialism uh, as if there is a generic template that exists. You were able to use the verb to be, colonialism is, and that navigation between that generic um, prototypical colonial, colonialism and its multiple uh, diversities around the world I thought was particularly well done. I would have questions perhaps at the end, uh, but let's open this up for the panel and the attendees. We have roughly about 46 people here. It was just 57 a few minutes ago, I think. Um, those of you who are in the panel can just raise your hand um, and I can, or Mike could call upon you. And if you are um, in the list of attendees who are not in the panel on the screen, you could, post your question in the Q&A and I'll read it out. And if I miss Mike, please let me know or you can read it out as well. Uh, we already have a question. Perhaps we go to that uh, from Chinaya Jangam um, and more questions are flowing in. So let's, let's take questions from the people whom we cannot see. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Manjapra, fascinating presentation. How do you account the complicity of elites in colonies who played critical role in the success colonialism, in the success of colonialism and turned against it. Can we count their resistance as counter history? This is connected to your idea of politics of clarity and history writing as witness that challenges the post-colonial deception through theory that obfuscates caste elites in South Asia using, using racial categories. Can you please elaborate on the politics of clarity? Um, thank you for this uh, question. Um, I, um, I, I feel that uh, we are at risk uh, in the study of colonialism in, uh, in fact, erasing um, the complexity at work here, especially as uh, elites are uh, Elites uh, constitute a, an important dimension of, of how power functions, the role of elites, uh, the role of intermediary actors. Um, but you know that there, there, I think there are two questions that, uh, that are being asked simultaneously. In, in the case of South Asia in particular, um, the history of caste, of course, is uh, uh, predating modern colonialism and continuing through modern colonialism. And while it is not, um, we wouldn't want to ascribe it or incorporate it into this global uh, framework of, of, of racialization in any facile way, I do want to propose that the, that formulation that I'm interested in of 
the ways in which um, power groups or enfranchised groups or dominant groups um, carry out overrepresentation, securitization, and uh, accumulation based upon, dependent on the um, disproportionate uh, subjection of oppressed groups to vulnerability and premature death. That formulation, uh, I think, provides us a way of both speaking on one hand about global processes of race that emerge through the new colonialism and the emergence of modern capitalism, as well as the long history of caste, which continues to operate today. This definition of power, um, this definition of um, uh, this particular kind of relationality that I'm that I'm talking about uh, is not one that is uh, the exclusive domain, the exclusive um, characteristic of Europeans and uh, European diasporas, but because it is relational, it shows up in all parts of the world, but with different manifestations and in different ways. And I think. Um, I would even wonder whether the language of elites, it gets, it is, if we can open up this language of elites uh, in order to um, uh, not necessarily um, constrain ourselves to uh, identifying, you know, well-defined specific groups who are the power groups and, and keeping those categories fixed, but also looking at how these uh, power groups show up in different locations in different ways. Um, so what I mean to say to be specific is that in the South Asian case, I think um, looking at caste uh, elites is essential. And uh, we have um, suffered in South Asian studies for a very long time in, with the uh, unavailability of even asking that question in a, in a, in a, in a really uh, deep way because of um, often the subject positions of those who are in the academy. In, in, in South Asian studies and the unavailability of, um, the, uh, of South Asian studies to people from, uh, for example, Dalit communities to, to be you know, at universities and, and, and doing research and being able to, to question the inherent elitism of um, South Asian uh, historical epistemologies. So I, I see that as a, as a major problem and I see that as a related problem to how in the United States, indigenous communities, not to say that indigenous, indigenous communities in the United States are comparatively the same as Dalit communities in India. That's, I'm not trying to make a, uh, an argument about sameness. I'm trying to make an argument of parallax to hold these different uh, pursuits, or these different problems in my mind simultaneously. That in the, United, uh, in, in, in the United States, for example, we see that indigenous scholars um, have been often excluded from positions in universities or access to resources to, to research and to write and to, uh, to narrate um, their history uh, in ways that disrupt the settler colonial epistemology that is inherent to the American university. And so I, I see these, um, these questions as held in parallax and as essential to the work of what is needed in history writing moving forward um, to, 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 to maybe I can boil it down in this way. We not only need to challenge and question the subject matter that we are researching, as well as the methodologies that we are using to study that subject matter, but also the subject, the situated knowledge of the very scholars themselves. And who are the scholars who are doing the research and who are the audiences who they're writing for needs to also be fully interrogated and disrupted uh, given the formation of the field of history that and of the university um, that we're so familiar with. So that's that would be my answer to that uh, question. I, I would I would say that you know it's, it, it really also relates to the situatedness of knowledge and the problems of fields today in terms of how close they are um, and how overrepresented they are in terms of the uh, in terms of dominant groups. Very well. I see uh, Samuel. I have an idea. 
those of you who are on the panel, if you could just chat, post a minute on the chat that you have a question, I'll know the order. And then the q and I can read the questions as they come in. So I'll first go to Andrew Olson, uh, who has a question in the Q&A, and then I'll come to Samuel. And meanwhile, others could please continue to post your questions. Um, Andrew um, is saying, you talked about the thesis and counter thesis. Uh, with colonial failure contrasting against colonial power slash domination, what would you say is the contrasting counter thesis to the idea of colonial necropolitics? Um, sure, good question. Uh, another good question. Um, I would use the word life affirming pursuit. <laughs> I think that um, inherent to uh, the resistances and the perseverance and the survivance of the colonized is um, life affirmation. Um, in, in contrast to the extractions um, and the, the, the death making uh, that is imposed through colonialism. How to make that more concrete? Um, you know, it's, it's it, when you, let, me, let me make it more concrete in, in, in terms of some, some examples. So when I think of the, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and as we're, we've seen it in 2020, but of course it goes back a number of years now, what I see in that movement is the key term black lives. And I see an insistence on affirming the vitality of blackness um, in the context of uh, anti-blackness, uh, of a moral and ontological order that uh, is fully necropolitical and is fully conditioned by the ongoing almost compulsion to, um, to, to, to destroy black life. Just look at you know, the prison industrial complex um, today. And so Black Lives Matter is about life affirmation. Um, so to, if I think of I Don't Know More um, or other you know, indigenous movements in the Americas and other parts of the world, there is this insistence on uh, the, uh, the, the ongoing presence of indigenous life in those very places that settler colonialism proposes that they have been in fact uh, lasted or eliminated. Um, and the performance of life that, um, that goes along with, for example, uh, the um, uh, Standing Rock or, or you know, other protests, um, the assertion of, of vitality. And then when we look at um, the ongoing people's democracy movements, even despite state oppression, for example, what has just been happening in the past two weeks in Nigeria, but even before then, the long history of people's movements, of people's democracy movements, of street movements uh, across, uh, across Africa, we again see people asserting life in the face of death making. And so I, I think that at the core of most decolonizing politics is life affirmation. Uh, and and uh, there was a, a I was at a, a, a uh, a talk last week on um, prison abolition. And I really appreciated what one of the community organizers was saying, which is that what abolition is about is about living the life that we must have, living with certainty the life of the future. Um, and, and so I, I find this, this kind of vitalist perspective very insightful to better understand um, that point that I was making earlier, the ways that uh, despite the ongoing attempts of colonialism, uh, the durability of life affirmation uh, seems to be uncontrollable, seems to be un, um, uncontainable. Uh, and, and, and I find that quite, uh, quite significant uh, for, for the past and also for our future. Thank you, Chris. Um, so life affirming rejection of date making, uh, not to disagree, but some interesting memory just came up. About 11 years ago, we had a, we had a talk here at Queens, one of our evening Nugent lectures. And David Scott of Columbia gave the talk. And the title of the talk was Revolution's Tragic Ends. And it was from uh, Conscripts of Modernity on the Haitian Revolution, the thought there is that revolutions can never succeed. And just as you say, colonialism can never succeed. 
resistant also cannot succeed. Uh, don't answer that, but you know, just came up in my mind to the impossibility of success where there is a binary involved. Uh, Samuel. Uh, thanks. My question is related to that as, uh, as well. Um, it, it, the, the idea that uh, colonialism or the story of colonialism as a story of failure strikes me as a little bit uh, optimistic and extraordinary claim. Um, and um, it raises the question, how do we measure failure and the success? If we, for example, see in the archive um, enslaved people engaged in some erotic activities or producing some cultural, some painting, for instance, would that constitute as um, a success, as a successful uh, counter activity against the um, uh, destructive dominant structure of slavery? That's my, my question. So if you can talk about how we can uh, calibrate uh, success and failure in this situation. And second question is, um, I have been I have been raised uh, st studying colonialism and how it operates and how in it, how the power of colonialism operates in different ways, and I, I your presentation left me left me with um, a nagging question: What's new in the in the global perspective? Col studying colonialism in a global perspective, what 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 new light does that is does does it uh, shade? What 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 uh, I mean? We know how. Um, uh, racial uh, logic is inherent in colonialism and how it operates by killing, maiming, and camping people. But what, what's new in, in, in your presentation? That's, that's the second question that I have. Thank you. Well, you're a very good graduate student because you ask a question like historians do, what's new? Um, uh, but uh, before I get to that question, um, let me uh, respond to the previous one. And it's also something that uh, Amitabha uh, asked, you know, I, I'll just say that you know, my, my, my beginning point uh, is um, feminist thought, and I've learned a lot from feminists of color. Um, and there is a phallocentric uh, perception uh, that, that um, you know, resistance looks one way or revolution looks one way. I think it's a very cis masculinist um, way of thinking. And it's, it's not something that I'm particularly interested in. I think it defines our fields. Um, and I think our fields have often been, um, have been written by cis men and the way that they think of um, beginnings and ends. I draw on uh, the writings, for example, of Hannah Arendt, um, Sylvia Winter, uh, Saidia Hartman, in the way they think of natality, um, in where they, in how they think of erotics, Audre Lorde, and how they think of erotics. And so without going into a big discussion about what I mean by um, a feminist perspective, um, which I don't think, I think your term of um, success feels very phallocentric to me. Um, and it's not, not my term, so I, I have no, no need to really reuse it. Uh, but I'll just leave, leave that there because I think that's a, a marker, which for some of you, you may be interested in, in either you already are exploring in those ways or you may continue to. And, and I think to your question of what's new, I, I don't really have an answer to that. I think, you know, um, I've said what I can say, and um, I, I, I believe that I've kind of made as much of an argument as I can of where I have felt there to be a need in the scholarship. Um, and, um, and maybe it'll speak to some of you, and, and maybe to some of you it'll seem familiar, and that's, that's fine. There is a question in the Q&A, uh, Morad Ruhi, who is a graduate student here at Queens. Um, if you could just write one line about who you are, in case I don't know you, that would be, that would be good. Um, the question is, how do you describe the relationship between colonialism and third world nationalism? Have various trends of nationalization been against the logic of global colonialism? Or they have been simply a tool to incorporate millions of indigenous people and their natural resources into capitalism. Um, was the question specifically about third world nationalism? Yes. Um, the relationship between colonialism as a concept and third world nationalism. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I would, I first of all agree that third world nationalism has played that, that role uh, in, um, you know, oppressing or, in trying to incorporate indigenous groups 
worldwide, uh, while at the same time there being another side to the story of third world nationalisms um, being uh, efforts in possibility, um, sometimes unrealized possibility to end uh, previous forms of colonial oppression. Um, so I, um, I, I believe that um, something that's increasingly important to me or in, of interest to me is, you know, what is taking place below the category of the nation state? How do those um, politics or those um, formations, how do they relate to uh, other um, endeavors, practices that are taking place elsewhere, you know, below the category of the nation state? Is there a third world history that can be written not through the uh, channeled through the form of the nation state, but that might actually circulate below it or above it. And, you know, there are many folks who are writing these days about subnationalist movements and how they uh, in some ways co uh, uh, converge or collaborate uh, or the relationship between subnationalisms and uh, internationalisms or transnationalisms. Um, and I think that those, those kinds of studies have always spoken to me much more than ones that are nation state bound. Um, and I do believe that this is something that critical indigenous studies really provides us uh, great insight into is how to break down that category of the nation state while also not rendering our studies only fragmentary, but allowing us to, to actually see the relationship between different fragments. Um, and maybe there is in fact different fractals in the sense that we see something reflected, something um, shared uh, between these seemingly, you know, disparate uh, projects. I mean, there are many people who work on archipelagic studies these days, and I feel like those those archipelagic approaches seem very very um, salient for a kind of new study of the global south or a new study of the third world. Okay. Um, any other question, Mike? And then David. Great, thank you, Anato. Um, I wanted to ask, and I'm, I'm really glad you brought up fractals, uh, Professor Manjapra, because I, this whole workshop we've been talking about connections and, and forms of connections. And I think as, as a lot of graduate students who presented their work, but professors as well, we're, we're shifting through archival materials to look for the direct connections. But your idea of fractals suggests that we can start to see connections even if they're necessarily aren't there. And I wondered about, from a very selfish perspective as a graduate student, how do we make those arguments in our in our monographs or in our articles that say, you know, there isn't the thread that we typically want to see. The web has more holes than it does connections, and yet the reflection is is what is compelling, and the reflection is the argument. Is that something that we should be comfortable making in history as a discipline, or or are we consciously now asking that we do something different within within our work? Yeah, this is a good, very good question too for me. Um, it reminds me of, you know, it's a question from the philosophy of history and I, uh, of history writing. And I, I think, for example, of Hayden White's work um, when he writes about metahistory and um, uh, he makes the observation that to write history is always to, what, as he says, narrate after the fact. So we're, we're all narrators um, and we're all in the pursuit of, of, of not necessarily telling the story, but where we are creating uh, a pattern of meaning. And the question that you're asking is, you know, how do, what's, what, what do, how do we do that if we want to, um, let's say, make visible uh, entanglements or relations that are not going to be necessarily traceable overtly in the archive? I do believe that the, the, the author plays a very important role here. I believe our strategies of narration become very important. Um, I believe, you know, techniques of, um, of juxtaposition uh, um, uh, become very important. And maybe even I would say, uh, erring on the side of breaking a mold without necessarily knowing what you're trying to create in the end is a very good thing to be able to do. Putting pieces together that, that don't necessarily overtly seem like they relate, but you as the author have a sense that they do, that is uh, not something that is at all inappropriate for a historian to do. That's actually part of what the historian's interpretive project is. So, so I would just say that um, as we 
are struggling or, or working on writing new kinds of global history, we do need to break the mold. And that does mean that the, the, the historian as narrator, the historian as artist um, must step forward. This is something that, that Hayden White says at the end of his book, um, that part of, you know, he has this critique of, of professional history as a, a history as a profession in which it becomes a lot about specialization and about um, uh, specialty knowledge and um, uh, uh, about replicating the established narrative. Uh, but for him, he says, this is how we lose our, our relevance. This is how we stop speaking to the urgencies of our world. Um, and so as opposed to uh, thinking of ourselves as professionals who are carrying out a certain kind of you know, operation on the archive, I think it's much more interesting for us as historians to ask the question, well, what is our archive? Why is that our archive? How do we relate different archives in a way that's highly distinctive and highly unusual? Um, and that might raise some people's eyebrows. I think that's a very, that's a very good way of, of being a historian um, and of maybe revealing a way of narration that we are still struggling to find. Uh, yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, for me, um, the, the search for entanglement has always been my, my need. I, 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 I want to find that in the material that I, that I look at as a historian and I do find it, um, but I find it through, um, you know, I, I find it often by stumbling across it, um, but I, I do believe that allows me to write in a different way than, for example, if I were working within a, a world region or if I had adopted a kind of nation state uh, approach. So, yeah, yeah, I'll just, I'll stop with that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we are nearing the end of our allotted time. We have three questions, David, and then in the uh, Q&A, Caitlin Arak, and then we'll end with Nancy's question. I see Nancy raising her hand. Um, I think we will cross our allotted time. I don't think we can do three questions in five minutes, but we'll see. David, you go first. Yeah, good to see you again, uh, oh, good to Chris. See you. Hi, David. Um, huge synthetic arguments like yours um, are going to spark uh, huge questions, and so I'm going to apologize in advance uh, for this, but it's your fault, not mine. Uh, where do you put uh, the epidemic disease in the Colombian exchange? And where do you put religious mission into your model? Uh, could you please explain why you privilege racializing capitalism over both of these, um, especially when talking about the Spanish in the 16th century? Um, I'm wondering if maybe if you had started uh, uh, your study 100 years later, uh, I wouldn't have had to ask this question. Sure. Um, yeah, that, that is a choice um, that I made to, um, to focus on histories of racialization. Uh, and I, don't, I do believe that the Colombian exchange has a place in, in the way that I'm explaining things um, because I do, have, I do have an interest in um, environmental transformation in ecological transformation. Um, but I relate this fundamentally to the emergence of uh, early capitalism. And so I think that we're going to get back to this point, which is, you know, my, my yes, it is my thesis, but because of that, it is obviously where we will have disagreements around its falsifiability. I mean, it is a falsifiable claim, therefore it is a thesis, but that is my claim, which is that um, the, that when we begin a writing a global history in which uh, we set um, capitalism and its emergence at the core, we inherently also must set racialization at the core. Uh, and this is a um, this is not saying that you know it's not about identifying um, necessarily individuals as agents. But it is about saying that there is a logic, a logic of racialization that that emerges and that actually begins to create forms of relation that uh, are unlike those before. And so that's it's because of that claim of racial capitalism and its relation to colonialism that I go back to the 1400s and I mark something before that's different from after, as opposed to beginning later, um, or as opposed to finding, you know, agency. Um, in, in other locations, for example, for example, like you're mentioning with the, the, the a more kind of environmental uh, explanation, 
or perhaps um, looking at, 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 at re religious actors. Um, I, I'm looking at a, I, I would put it that I'm looking at a predicament, I'm looking at a condition, and I call that condition um, racial capitalism, and I see it as having existed in the past, but also existing today. And I realize all of that raises a lot of questions. <laughs> And it can be very debated, but I think that's a that's a that's a useful debate. At least that's that's a debate that really um, inspires inspires me. Yeah, to have. Yeah. Okay, my apologies to the panel because you know I'm working with a small screen and the Q and A small window was blocking my chat window, and I see many questions were posted there. Um, I think what we should do is go to the questions one question from the Q and A, and then we can continue in the panel. And if it is inconvenient for the attendees, you can sign out at some point. We are almost close to time. Uh, Caitlin Arak, graduate student here at Queens, is asking, I was wondering if you could expand on your study of materiality. I find it fascinating that you were reading resistance in the objects made within systems of colonization. And I wonder how using this alternative archives uh, furthers an understanding of transformative resistance and how it can expand the field even farther. Yeah. Um, here we really benefit from uh, interdisciplinary reading, and I, you know, I, I'm I'm grateful for the writings of Raymond Williams um, and Stuart Hall and other cultural uh, theorists who point out that um, artifacts, all all. Uh, cultural productions um, are, as they call, mediations of history. And so, what what do we mean by mediations of history? Um, that you know, all artifacts, all writing, all cultural products, um, in fact, are encoded, and they are they manifest um, the the history of which they are a part. Sometimes they confess that history. Sometimes they hide that history and uh, they have to be interpreted in order to reveal um, what in fact is all there. But they, they, artifacts are mediations of the historical condition um, for their existence. You know, that would be kind of a Raymond Williams formation. Um, and if we take that as the starting point, it, it raises then methodological questions for us as, as historians. Um, especially given that we're trained and professionalized to recognize the archive in a particular way, at least that's my experience, um, often a state archive or often a trove of, you know, documents. Um, and so we, we have to now uh, overhear and learn from the rich, tr the rich discussions that are in other disciplines who have ta already taken Raymond Williams and others uh, insight seriously for many decades. So I'm thinking of performance studies, I'm thinking of um, literature studies, uh, I'm thinking of anthropology, and I believe this is an important path forward for um, history writing is to really take seriously what it means to study an object from with these different kinds of expertise and to try to borrow some of those tools um, in order to in order to understand the mediations that are at work, because I do believe quite a bit is encoded that it is on us uh, to be able to witness, especially if uh, you know the counter histories are by the nature of power, if they are the ones that are in the shadows uh, and that have to be brought into the light. Um, Chris, are you okay to continue? I have four questions as far as sure. I sure. Yes, of course. Uh, sure. I'll go to Tirana first. Tirana Baines. Thank you. Um, I wanted to begin by very quickly thinking or talking about why your work is important, why it's new, and uh, having taught a class earlier today working with undergraduates talking about the beginnings of slavery in the British Empire. I think it's definitely useful as a text to assign widely. And just looking at the table of contents, I think it's useful for undergraduates to think in terms of these political institutions, think in terms of fourth settlement um, plantations, and especially because the extent to which historians and others working in other disciplines haven't quite surpassed the sort of Atlantic world or Indian Ocean world boundaries. Even as we commit ourselves to oceanic histories or sort of global imperial histories, we are still confining ourselves to particular boundaries, which is why I feel like your work is really important for speaking to a broader public and educating undergraduates. So even if I, as a historian of 18th century Britain might wanna nitpick about a particular detail, 
um, I can't argue with the fact that this is something I would really like to assign to undergraduates. Um, so turning to my question, I was curious, and you, you, it depends on you how, how much of it you want to tackle. I, I was curious about what you make of states as institutions, not necessarily at the level of a nation state, but all forms of governance, governance at local levels, uh, even governance um, you know, at the level of sort of supranational bodies, institutions like the European Union. To what extent is the um, are these institutions so deeply ingrained in a sort of global history of colonial practice or imperial technologies of government that, um, so how do projects of decolonization progress when we are thinking about governance, statecraft? What do we make of governance itself when we're trying to actively decolonize? And I know that's a really broad question, so you could perhaps uh, combine it with some others, but thank you for your talk and your work. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know if I have a, a, a a very good response to your question. I think it's a it's an important question, but I'll just say um, something that I've been thinking of very recently, which is um, the ways that um, decolonizing practices uh, are often uh, carried out. Uh, you might say, yeah, sometimes through state apparatuses, but they're often carried out um, under them, alongside them, in parallel to them, because. Uh, colonized groups, oppressed groups, do not have access to representation or equitable or, or, or equitable representation through the state, or that the state apparatus is in fact um, genocidal uh, to their very existence. And so, I'm thinking specifically of um, the ways that the colonized um, develop uh, both develop new kinds of webs or networks of uh, governance from below. Um, in the American South, the history of mutual aid societies um, and the, 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 the ways that black churches served as centers for not just um, what a church you would expect a church for, but were actually forms of government governance from below, um, including caring for the birth, the life and the death uh, and the burial um, of their members, as well as creating, you know, networks for um, for emancipation um, and run and and, uh, and and freedom struggle in terms of the Underground Railroad. So I think of these uh, submerged networks of the colonized as as a, as uh, I think of it as a form of, of governance, but um, a governance that cannot that necessarily is um, not included in the state. <laughs> That's why. The colonized, you know, have to um, have to uh, innovate. Uh, the um, um, there's another thought that was coming to my mind on this, but I, I'll, if it comes back, I'll I'll, I'll 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 say more. But yeah, that that I, I think is um, a very interesting uh, observation. Um, yeah, I'll stop there now. If it comes back, I'll come back. Nancy, would you mind if I finish the Q&A questions first and come to you at the end? Is it okay? Or do you have to? Um, so Irina Scooby, uh, thank you for an inspiring talk. Can you quickly comment on the role of famines in the history of global colonialism? Sure. Um, sorry, a, a thought came back to my mind in terms of the past question. Let me just finish that, which is that um, I also find it very fascinating how uh, for the colonized, there are a variety of customary forms of sociality, uh, um, of relationship uh, that get woven into the networks that then emerge. So uh, the ways that um, you know, kinship relations um, or uh, the ways that you know, intergenerational connections or like we were talking about the black church, uh, religious communities, which have a, a, can have a kind of customary uh, as opposed to a um, fully administered state-like uh, quality to them, how these more customary forms of sociality uh, and of relationship become quite important to the colonized precisely because the administered forms of the state uh, are, are often held within the hands of, of, of the colonizers, so to speak. So, so, so this is only to say that um, the colonized seem to be always mixing 
old forms and new, um, mixing the customary and the contractual, um, living between, you know, in the kind of borderlands between uh, some of the, the, the established categories that historians use. We think of the state as, as you know, the, a feature of modernity. Um, but, but, you know, is modernity the same for the colonized as it is for the colonizer, so to speak? Um, what does, what is, what, what is the colonized modernity if it in fact has imbricated in it um, features of the customary, which are necessary for survival? So this is a, this is kind of an interesting question for me that's generated by what you just asked. Thank you. Famine. I won't say much about this except to say that, um, the, this broaches the question of uh, how colonialism, has, and for, for me, it broaches the question of how colonialism and environmental studies or uh, environment studies relate, uh, and specifically the ways in which maldistribution um, and um, uh, ex exploitation of natural resources, but specifically maldistribution, um, emerge uh, as an inherent dimension of colonial force, um, of necropolitical power. So maybe I can just ask the question within this language is that what does it, what is it like, what would it, what would that study be like if we were to study famine uh, in a relational framework as a feature of necropolitics? And maybe we could connect the study of famine with the study of food deserts, given that um, you know, famines we think of as uh, major catastrophic events, but what about the minor catastrophes of food deserts, which uh, pockmark, you know, many states today, uh, and that are also the product of ongoing colonial force. So here, there's a way of linking the, the, the large scale and the small scale, which I think is, it would be very, very interesting, uh, and would also relate to uh, a kind of bridge between colonialism studies and environment studies and food studies. Uh, Chris, if you could briefly touch upon a question from Erica Potter, MS student here at Queens, and then uh, we'll have one more question. We'll end with Nancy's question. Um, Erica is asking, you speak about making connections when you do not have an archival connection and you have reference, reference Sadia Hartman. I wonder if you could speak about critical fabulation and the integration of narrative practices in addition to the archival sources when making historical inquiries of marginalized peoples who are rendered invisible within the written record? Yeah, great question. I think I might just edit, uh, add my own edit to the question to say that, um, is it helpful if we uh, ask, what does it mean to say making connections without archival connections? I, I'm, I, I pause at that because it, that brings back the question, what is the archive? What do we mean by finding archival connections? That it becomes a question for me. As historians, our project is not necessarily to look into the past and find material that we then write about, as if that material is um, some kind of you know, resource that we access. I think as historians, our, our, our purpose is to put on particular kinds of lenses to interpret uh, material, our world in particular ways that create meaning um, and that uh, open up opportunities for new meaning. And so, so I, see the, I see our work as less about um, finding the archive than, uh, and more about putting on lenses that allow us to see new archives. I, that, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference there. Um, and so I don't actually think that it's about um, necessarily fabulating uh, connections where they don't exist, because I think the, exact action, action, the connections actually do exist. <laughs> I think you know, the argument is that the history of our world makes it such that the connections do exist. They are actual. They may fall outside of our established ontologies or epistemologies, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means that we don't easily grasp them. And so it's really a question of how do we adjust our epistemology to make room for what actually does exist, but which we do not easily represent in how we understand the world. And I think that's really what Saivia Hartman is getting at with critical fabulation, that the experiences that she's 
addressing are as material as what is in you know the quote unquote archive in the in you know in whatever whatever archive we want to, to to point to whatever state archive is just that our tools are lacking are failed and so critical critical fabulation is a way of um, supplementing our tools uh, expanding our tools um, because our project is an interpretive project um, and uh, and we as historians are interpreters. I, I think that and that gets back to a question that was asked earlier about the historian as a narrator. I, I, I think um, these these are these are connected, uh, and it gives us a different purchase on what we are seeking to do um, and and what our project is uh, in history writing. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Nancy, for your patience. Uh, if not the last word, you have the last question. Uh, uh, okay, good. No, my question is in your search for entanglement, what are you and your colleagues doing at Tufts to change some of the academic structures? Thank you for that question. Yeah, You're great, welcome. because it allows me to right. comment on something that I, uh, I put a pin in something earlier and I appreciate that you've come back to it. Um, so yes, and a great place to end that um, how would I say this in a in a in a um, condensed way? Um, we uh, at at Tufts have uh, created through collaboration this new department, the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora, which uh, is um, very explicitly a department that um, seeks to relate and bring together uh, disciplines. Out beyond the kind of more siloed approach of the university. And so in our group, we have uh, folks who are in performance studies and anthropology and history and art history and sociology. And we struggle, but I think it's a very productive struggle um, to find the kinds of questions and the critical concepts that, um, that allow us to speak about um, questions in common, in shared ways, but then also to, to, to be able to show to each other um, what, where the limits of our uh, epistemology, our disciplinary epistemology is. That, that kind of self-delimiting discussion I have found really useful um, to learn, for example, to hear from a literature scholar say, just because you're a historian, you don't monopolize or own how to write about history. You know, we write about history too. We write about it differently. And this is why, this is how we do it. That for me is very useful, um, and uh, and I and I, it calls into question what I do as a historian, and, and I think it has enriched how I do what I do. And that article that I wrote with my colleague Lisa, who is a literature scholar, is an example of just a very concrete kind of fruit of what that kind of manifest meditation has led to. And just and administratively, um, what this means is that um, you know we've been able to put pressure on the university. And that's also a story about organizing, I think, and you know what Fred Moulton calls the undercommons, uh, and as they show up in institutions, places to try to bring transformative change. We have tried to put pressure on the institution uh, to change the way that it thinks of its curriculum, and so far it's been somewhat successful. You know, we have um, we've made a series of of, of hires. Uh, we will continue to make hires and the hires that we're making are also uh, specifically for scholars who are working between disciplines and who are young scholars who uh, just in the way that they are in their situatedness uh, in how they've learned and what they've learned are are already uninterested <laughs> in performing the kind of disciplinarity um, that that I've been trained into and that I I'm trying to break away from. So, so there, I wouldn't call it indisciplinarity. I would just call it irreverence. I think it's a very, it's a very irreverent department, and um, and it's it's it feels great to have a, a location in the university that um, a foothold in the university where we can be irreverent uh, because it's it's good for our minds, it's good for our spirits. Uh, I'm finding. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hmm. I believe that actually brings us to the end um, and we have run out of time for a while now. Uh, thank you, Chris, for a very illuminating talk. Thanks everyone for important, useful questions that Roger helped us understand the project. 
um, if the world turn, starts turning again, I hope to see you in person. Till then, the conference is over. Good night, everybody. We can't applaud, we can perhaps just wave. Thank you, I really enjoyed this and I hope we'll all meet again. Take good care. Take care, bye. Bye.